It was a great day when we saw Jesus welcomed and cheered by the crowds in Jerusalem. I thought that the next step would be to put him on the throne and he could rule the world right then and there. But that wasn't his plan. During the Passover meal, he began to prepare us for betrayal. By who? We didn't understand. He even said that I, Peter, the rock, would fail to stand up for him. In fact, he said that I would deny I even knew him. I didn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I was ready to take on Roman soldiers if necessary and die for him. I said that I would die for him. I really thought I could. But there I was denying him. Never thought I would. I failed the Lord, let him die after all he's done for me. Now he's walking up a hill hill called Calvary. Calvary, Calvary, was it meant for him? Was it meant for me? Calvary. Is that my cross he's taking to Calvary?
He could have come in all his splendor, greater than the eye has ever seen. He could have come in robes of scarlet, and all the world would see that he is king. He could have ridden on a white horse as a warrior and conquered every land. Mm -hmm. But he knew that if redemption's prize were paid, it would take a land. For many years the temple altars were stained with sacrifices every day. And though the blood appeased the Father, still the curse of sin was never washed away. Until one day the rule of justice was halted by a touch from mercy's hand, mercy's hand. As the Father in compassion said, it's time to send the spotless lamb, precious spotless lamb.
Bible says when he died on the cross, he became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Thank God for the cross. It doesn't get any more important to our salvation than the cross. So praise God for Jesus and the cross. Let's stand together. If you have a copy of the scripture, just hold it up like this and say with me, this is my Bible. God's holy word. A lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's inerrant. It's infallible. It's authoritative. It's more powerful than any sharp two-edged sword. It is fire shut from my bones. I must speak it. It is food for my soul. I'm ready now to receive it. Turn with me to the gospel or the scripture lesson in the epistle of First John. The epistle of First John, beginning in verse four, or chapter four and verse eleven. Beloved, if God is if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. Because fear ha involves torment. But he who, ha who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that has led us and brought us to this place of worship and brought us to the cross where we have received uh, forgiveness for our sins and the gift of eternal life. Thank you so much for the cross on which Jesus died. Thank you for this day that we can celebrate our risen Savior who is not on the cross but has been taken down from the cross and has ascended up on high, seated at the right hand of the Father on the throne, from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Thank you for being one of yours today, Father. Thank you for knowing uh, us through Jesus Christ. And we praise you, Lord, that each and every one here today may have that love that you had for us, that we may return that love to you in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. If you uh, look in your bulletin, you'll find... a uh, a copy of today's Bible study notes. And I'd like to begin uh, with uh, one of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis on perfection. Our title today is Perfection Possible for You. And uh, C.S. Lewis says in Mere Christianity, Our Lord's words, be ye perfect. Some people seem to think this means, unless you are perfect, I will not help you. As we cannot be perfect, then if he meant that, our position is helpless. But I do not think he meant that. I think he meant the only help I will give is help to become perfect. You may want something less, but I will not give you nothing less. That's pretty profound. C.S. Lewis said when he was a kid, uh, he would hate uh, to tell his mother he had a toothache. He said, if I told her I had a toothache, she would give me what I wanted, but she would give me a lot more than I wanted. In other words, she would give me an aspirin for the pain, 
But the next morning, she'd take me to the dentist, which I didn't want. And you know those dentists, dentists, they start fooling around your teeth. You give them an inch, they'll take a mile. They don't give up. They want to put everything right. And this is what Lewis is saying about God. You don't have to be perfect for God to help you. But the only help God offers you is the help to become perfect. Whoa. There are few things in this world that's perfect. I've heard there's perfect pitch. I don't got it, but it's, it's an auditorial phenomenon known as uh, the ability to hear a certain musical note and repeat it. Gerald could probably do that. Perfect pitch. Seems like another planet. There's such things as a perfect baseball game. No runs, no hits, no errors. There's a thing as a perfect bowling game, 300. I've never done that either. There's a, such a thing as a perfect golf swing. I don't know who determines that. But they say there's a perfect golf swing. I'm seeking that. They say God made a few perfect heads. And the rest he put hair on. <laughs> but is there such a thing as perfect love? And that's what our scripture uh, says on three different occasions. In uh, verse uh, 12, it talks about perfect love. In verse 17, perfect love. In verse 18, perfect love. Is there such a thing as perfect love? You see, the reason you define perfection is so that you would aspire to it. You would, you would try to attain it. And if there is such a thing as perfect love and it's attainable, wouldn't you want it? Wouldn't you desire it? After all, when you think about love, Love is the only thing that really makes life meaningful, isn't it? I mean, it has to be the love for your parents, your love for your spouse, the love for your children, for family, for church, for community, for friends. Without love for those people and love from those people, life is worthless. Amen? Are you with me? So if a little love brings a little joy... More love would bring more joy. And perfect love would bring perfect joy. Do you see where I'm going with this? So if it's attainable, if perfection in love is attainable, is it possible for you? If it's not attainable, it's not possible for you. But if it is, it's possible for you. I believe this scripture today gives us three steps to attain perfect love perfect love. And I'd like for you to follow with me in, uh, as we, uh, as we uh, go through the scriptures. The first step to attain perfect love is to allow God to abide in us. Allow God to abide in us. That's what verse uh, 12 is talking about. No one has seen God at any kind. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love has been what? Perfected in us. Perfected in us. So we have to allow God to abide in us. In other words, we don't push him away. We don't hold him off. We don't resist him. If we allow him to invade our hearts, if we allow him to dwell in our being and abide in us, then his love is going to be perfected perfect love. Under Bible study note A, I want you to note this, the only love that is perfect is God's love, which is called agape. Now we know what uh, romantic love is, we know what uh, family love is, we know what friendship love is, none of that is perfect. God's love is perfect, agape. And this is what you find in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, remember? You read the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, it begins by saying, if I had the 
uh, the tongue of angels and have not love, I'm nothing. God's love. If I give my body to be burned and sell everything I have and give my money to the poor and have not God's love, I'm nothing. This is the, this is the thing to seek for. It's the thing that makes life meaningful. And then it goes on to describe what God's love is. What is it? It's gentle. It's kind. It's good. It's pure. It's not jealous. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It doesn't puff itself up. It's not arrogant. It bears all things. Amen. It, it, uh, it loves as only God can love. That's God's love. And then there's a little verse that goes on to say, here in 1 Corinthians 13, here we see in part, we understand in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then we will know as we are known. What is that perfect that is going to come? It's love. Now, people think, well, that'll just come when we see God. That'll just come when we get to heaven. And surely it will. But what if it's possible to have perfect love in this world? He said, if his love abides in you, it's, uh, or if God abides in you, his love is perfected in you. Now, what does that word perfected mean? Under Bible study note B, this is what it means. It means that God's love attains a proper maturity in you. In other words, when you begin as a Christian, uh, his love is an infinite stage. And hopefully you mature as a Christian, you mature in love. Now, I know today I have a lot more of God's love in my heart than I did when I first uh, became a Christian. I hope you can say that. But I know that there are some Christians who haven't grown in love, matured in love at all. Because you resisted God abiding in your heart. You, you, you let the world abide in your life and abide in your heart instead of God. You let God abide in there. And his love will mature. It will grow. Here's uh, what verse uh, 13 says. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. So he abides in us through the spirit. Romans 8 and 9 says, you're not of the flesh, you're of the Spirit. If so be, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if you do not have the Spirit of God, you're none of His. If you, if you don't have the Spirit of God in your life, if you haven't been born of the Spirit, you're not of God, so this doesn't apply. But if you have the Spirit of God in your heart, you've been born of the Spirit, then the Spirit of God uh, matures love in your life. How does it do that in this fashion? Uh, Ephesians 5, uh, 18 says, don't be drunk with wine. Or, you know, why not say it? Don't be drunk with marijuana. Everybody wanting to legalize marijuana. Don't be drunk with anything. That's what the world does. They want to they, they, they wanna legalize and legitimize uh, things that will uh, make them lose control. But it, the Bible says don't, uh, be drunk, but be filled with the Spirit. Let God be in control. If the Holy Spirit uh, fills your life, then God is in control. And if God is in control, then love abounds in your heart. And it develops, and it grows, and it grows, and it increases. And perfect love is possible, isn't it? Think about it. There's only one man that I know that uh, really taught perfection and uh, got criticized uh, greatly for it, and that was uh, John Wesley. John Wesley wrote an entire book on perfection, and he is criticized in this regard uh, because uh, people thought Wesley was saying to be perfect, you couldn't make a bad choice, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't make a mistake. Uh, it had to do with your character and your conduct. Wesley never said that. What he was saying is that you can be perfect in love. That's a different deal, isn't it? That's what this verse, that's what this chapter is saying. Perfect love, cast out fear. Perfect love, God's love being perfected in us. So what does that look like if, if you have perfect love? What would it look like? Wesley gave us a picture of it. Back in 1700, he took his little Kodak, 
took a picture of it. This is what it looks like. Under Bible study note C, it's the character of a Methodist. Now, don't be mistaken. Some of you are going to say, is that United Methodist? No, no, no. That's not Free Methodist? No, no, no. That's not Christ, uh, uh, Church of Christ Christian Union? No, no, no. No, when he was talking about a Methodist, he was not talking about a denomination. He was talking about a methodical way of serving God. He had a methodical way of doing worship and Bible study, a methodical way of doing prayer and growing in Christ. You understand what I'm saying? So it wasn't the denomination, but it was a methodical approach to, to growing in grace. He was serious about growing in God's grace and growing in God's love. And so he gave us this picture of what perfect love looked like in what he calls a character of a Methodist. Now, I believe John Wesley would be, uh, be very proud if all the United Methodists would come up to this character. I would be very proud if some of the Baptists would too, amen? So here's what it looks like. Uh, he loves God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, right away, you're going to say, oh, nobody can do that. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Nobody can do that. That's not attainable. If it's not attainable, then we don't need to talk about it. Who talked about it? Jesus. What did he say about that first sentence? He said, this is the greatest commandment. Amen? This is more important than the Ten Commandments. Amen? Now, if it's a commandment, duh, would God give us a commandment we couldn't obey? This is possible. Uh, in everything, give thanks. First, John, uh, First Thessalonians 5, 16 and 17. Paul taught everything, give thanks. You can't be grateful? Yes, you can. You can be a lot more grateful than you are. Amen? Uh, in everything, give thanks. A uh, heart lifted up to God all the time, loves every man as his own soul, is the second commandment. To love your neighbor as yourself. Amen? This is a picture of perfect love. Don't say, I can't do this. You can do this. Pure in heart. What is pure in heart? Uh, James 4, 7 and 8, resist the devil, he'll flee from you, draw nigh unto God, he'll draw nigh unto you, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. A pure heart is not double-minded. A pure heart has a single purpose, to serve God. So pure in heart is something I can do. God reigns alone. That doesn't mean anything other than making Jesus not just Savior, but Lord of your life. Lord of your life. Keeps all the commandments. Well, there you go, Jerry. You blew it on that one. We can't keep all the commandments. No way. Hey, who said you couldn't keep all the commandments? God tell you that? The devil told you that. I'll tell you what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 3. Before he ever became a Christian, he kept all the commandments. He was blameless of any disobedience. So don't say you can't keep all the commandments. Don't say you can't have love perfected. It can be perfected in your heart. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. And I've seen people who have been close to God and allow God to abide in their heart till their love has been perfected. I think of Sam Lawless. He's dead now. You see, I wouldn't point out somebody that's still alive like Gerald because you, you would fo start following him around and see how, how he acts. But Sam Lawless died some years ago. He was 101, uh, a member of our church, and we loved him. But, uh, man, he loved people, and people loved him. Sam Lawless, uh, when he was 96, he bought a brand-new car. There wasn't very many people ride with him. I did. Pastor Dave did. He'd go up to a stop sign, 40 mile an hour. Put on the brakes, stop on a dime. Sam said, I got 20-20 vision, Jerry. <laughs> but he says, my reactions are very slow. <laughs> yeah. He went over to Kroger's. Kroger's, uh, he'd go into Kroger's, it's like he's a celebrity. You know, it's like he was a, 
you know, one of these guys with a guitar and had these band or something. These people went gaga over Sam. He walked into Kroger's one day, and there was a guy there stealing alcohol. Had an overcoat on, had bottles of alcohol inside of his coat everywhere he could get him. He ran into Sam when Sam come in the door, knocked Sam down. He was like 98, 99. Knocked Sam down. Sam knocked him down. Only when he fell, all the bottles broke, and he was laying there bleeding like a stuck hog. Everybody in Kroger stopped everything and come took care of Sam while the guy bled to death. That was Sam. That's how people loved him. When he turned 100, the, when he turned 100, the whole city celebrated, had a proclamation. This is a member of our church. But he had love. And as, as much as people loved him, he loved them more. He would just get right in my face. And he'd say, Brother Chandler, you're the most wonderful preacher in all the world. And I felt like I was on a cloud. I mean, I, I was just a, I, I was something. And here's the thing. He did everybody like that. He's seen what you did, how you, how you acted, how you talked, how you dressed. You were the greatest. Sam, love people. Don't tell me you can't love more than what you're doing now. You have a lot of space in your heart to grow in love and have it perfected in your life. Just don't push God out. Allow him to abide in your heart. Because when he comes in, he comes in with his love. Amen? Number two. Number two. The second step to uh, attaining perfected, perfect love is uh, identify with Jesus above us. So uh, allow God to abide in us and identify with Jesus above us. Why is that important? Verse 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. What does boldness in the day of judgment mean? You will not have guilt. You will not have condemnation. You will not have any fear. Boldness in the day of judgment. I want to tell you, I've had a funeral every week for the last two or three weeks, and there's a couple more backed up that's probably going to come the next week. We are going to be, sooner or later, in the day of judgment. But perfect love, uh, if love is perfected, we will go to judgment without fear, without condemnation, without guilt. Why? Because as he is. Now, you need to underscore this line because this is a, a biblical piece of state. This is a, a theological mountain top right here because as it underscore that now if you got a device and you can't underscore throw the sucker away and get you a real bible because because as he is notice as he is so are we in this world this is big as he is so are we but before we look at as he is let's look at where he is where is he well he's not on the cross He's not in the tomb. He's been resurrected, and he's ascended, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father now. Amen? That's where he is. Now, as he is, as he is right now, he is perfect. And it says, as he is, so are we in this world. Now, to identify with Jesus means this. As I quoted a while ago, when he died on the cross, he became sin and that we might become the righteousness of God. He identified with our sin. We identify with his righteousness when we got saved. That's called justification. That's the beginning of our salvation. So here's the deal. As he is righteous, we identify with him. Our position with him is righteous. Our position with him is holy. As, as a Christian... I'm positioned in Christ in this world. I am perfect before Christ in my position. Are you okay with that? Can, can you follow that? As I identify with him on the cross, he took my sin. He gave me his righteousness. Therefore, his righteousness is perfect. As he is, so am I in this world. Are you there? So I am righteous. 
in my position. Now look at Bible study note A. Identify and affirm our position in Christ so that that will change our position in the world. Are you with me? So here I am, my position in Christ is that I am perfect. My condition in the world, I am not perfect. But as I identify my position, affirm my position, meditate on my position, all right, focus on my position, that gives me the power to have my condition change in the world, and I become more and more like Christ. Are we on the same page? Are you with me? So as he is, so are we in Christ. Now, uh, go to uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 6. I'm going to put it on the screen in case uh, you brought your device and it's not working. Your battery's out, run down. And we're going to go to chapter 6, Romans 6, 6. And this is what it says about identifying with Christ. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. How are we to identify with him? When he died on the cross, this is what Paul said. When he died on the cross, we died on the cross. Amen? We are crucified with him. When we become a Christian, we identify with his death on the cross. And when we are crucified with him, what happens is the body of sin is done away with that we should no longer serve sin. Now, if we can get sin out of our life, what can come in? The love of God. You get sin out of your heart, get the world out of your heart, and, and you crucify yourself with Christ, then you have room for the love of God to come into your heart. But we got to kill that old man of sin, that old uh, uh, Adam nature. We put to death the old man. Now, if you look at chapter 6, verse 11 under Romans, what you're going to find there is a new word that I like a lot. It says, likewise, also reckon yourself to be dead, indeed to sin. Now, the word reckon is an accounting term. It means to consider or count. It is an accounting term, to reckon. Reckon the books, reckon something. It's done, it's finished, it's reckoned. And so, if you don't have that word, you may have consider or you may have count in your version. But under uh, verse 11, when it says to reckon yourself dead, it literally means you have been crucified with Christ, therefore just consider yourself dead. Just reckon yourself dead. In other words, you may have to do this. You may have to crucify yourself again and again and again. A fellow asked me one time when I told him if he become a Christian that he would die with Christ, the old man would be uh, put to death, and he'd have a new man. He'd live in a new life. He said, what if the old man comes back to life? Good question. You kill him and kill him and kill him and kill him again and again and again. Are you with me on this? I mean, I'm not talking about something out there in la-la land. I'm talking about where you live. And you know when that old man comes back to life. Anger rears up. Jealousy rears up. You put him back to death. Stick him in the grave where he belongs. Amen? And this is what a Bible study note B says. James McConnell says, our reckoning ourselves uh, dead to sin in Jesus Christ does not make it a fact. Just reckoning it doesn't make it a fact. He said it already is a fact through our union with him. It's already a fact. What it does, our reckoning it to be true, only makes us begin to realize the fact in experience. So if we can start doing that, we'll begin to experience the end of sin in our life, the death of the old man, and, and a, a new infusion of love in our hearts. That's what's going to happen. But we got to count him dead and dead and dead and dead. Paul said, I protest with your rejoicing. I die daily in Christ. One of my favorite stories was told by Joe Gibbs. Many of you have heard it. But Joe Gibbs was the coach of the Washington Redskins. And he had an old offensive lineman, 300 and some pound brute, that had a, a black Labrador retriever. And he went home one night from practice, and his black Labrador retriever was laying on the front porch. 
with a dead rabbit in front of him. He noticed the dead rabbit was his neighbor's pet rabbit. He'd seen it many times in a cage. He immediately didn't want trouble with his neighbor. He took the dead rabbit in the house, put it in a bathtub, scrubbed it with shampoo, took a blow dryer and blowed it dry. And when it got dark, he snuck in the backyard and put that dead, beautiful, groomed rabbit back in the cage. Went to practice the next day. When he got home, his next-door neighbor was on the front porch. And this time, the next-door neighbor is irate. He said, do you understand there's a crazy man in this neighborhood? He said, what do you mean, being oblivious? He said, someone, my rabbit died, and someone dug it up and gave it a shampoo and blew it the fur dry and put it back in his cage. There's a crazy loose. And Joe Gibbs said the moral of the story is simple. If it's dead, leave it dead. Are you with me? That's how you use this word reckon. You died with Christ when that old anger, temper, jealousy, bitterness uh, begins to flare. Stomp it out. Knock it in the head. Put it in the grave. Kill it again and again. Leave it dead. And there'll be room for love to flow in your life. Amen? You see, the reason this is so important, Watchman Nee, who was a great uh, leader of the house church in China, Watchman Nee, a tremendous theologian, he said this under Bible study note C. He said, the blood can wash away my sin, but it cannot wash away the old man. Do you understand that? The blood of Jesus can wash away your sin, but it can't take care of the old man. It needs the cross to crucify me, the sinner. Our sins are dealt with by the blood, but we ourselves are dealt with with the cross. You see, our sins, plural, is washed away with blood. But the sin, which is singular, which is who I am, a sinner, cannot be washed away. It must be crucified. The blood procures my pardon. The cross procures our deliverance from what we are. What we are is a corrupt, miserable sinner. And the cross slays who I am so that I can be what I am not. Amen? Here's a mistake a lot of us make. We think, well, if I'm having a hard time, I'll just bear down. And I'll just try harder. And I'll just break some of the habits I have. And I, I'll be a better Christian. No, no, no. That's not the way it works. I mean, you can break habits, but you can't break the power of sin. That's the problem. My wife and I have this thing going on. I wouldn't call it a, an argument, a spiritual discussion. We get in our car. We have two cars, and they both have this ding a ling a ling every time you go. If you don't put your seatbelt on, ding a ling a ling. I want to tell you, I have had ding a ling a lings right up the back. I can climb a wall. I said to my wife, please don't make a ding a ling a ling. I've stopped in the middle of the road. I've told her 16 times driving out of the driveway, fasten that seatbelt. I don't want to hear it. And it ding a ling a ling. So I got a new thing going. I said, honey, if you will fasten your seatbelt and I don't hear a ding a ling a ling, every time that happens, I'm going to give you $50. That's what I say. That's what I'd say. So someone asked her the other day, said, uh, so has your husband paid you any money yet? And there's not any need to do that. Last count, I said, if you don't fasten your seatbelt, and I hear the ding a ling a ling, you paid me $50. Two days ago, she was up to 1000 She owes me a thousand bucks. But that was two days ago, and we've been in the car several times since, and all of a sudden I go out, and there's no ding a ling a ling. She gets $50 back. She's down to $550. I'm really concerned. 
that she's breaking this habit, and I'm going to start paying. I think she can do it. And you hear, here's the thing. I think you can do it. I think you can break habits, but you can't break the power of sin. The only thing will do that is the cross. You have to be crucified with Christ. And Paul said, I am crucified with him. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. It is Christ that lives in me. That's how the love perfects itself in us, by identifying with Christ. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who died for me and gave himself for me. Praise God for the one who died for us, the power of the cross. I am crucified with him, giving praise if that's your sake. Oh, my, my, my. So allow God to abide in us. Identify with Christ above us. And then embrace your brothers around us. And that's what the next verse or so says. If you look at it uh, in chapter uh, 4, in verse 20, if someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God from whom he has not seen? There's no way to love God vertically unless you love your brother horizontally. Now, I'm getting down to where you live and where I live because we cannot claim to have any uh, love for God if we don't have love for those around us. We have to embrace those around us. And here's the reason. Under Bible study note A, perfect love cannot flow into our lives from God unless it flows out of our lives toward others, towards our fellow man. You want more of God's love? Good. But you've got to release it because it will explode in your heart and you'll die inside if you receive it and don't let it out to other people. You know the reason the Dead Sea is dead, it's because it's the lowest place in the world below sea level, and everything flows into it, and nothing flows out. The water evaporates, and all you got is ooey-gooey minerals. You can't swim in the Dead Sea. You can't sink in the Dead Sea. It's just a cesspool of minerals. It's dead. And here's the, here's the thing. We can't let God's love flow in us unless it flows through us. If it's going to be perfect, it's got to have an outlet to our fellow man. And here's how you love people. You love them individually. You spell love A-T-T-E-N-T-I-O-N, attention. You can't love your fellow man. You can't love your brothers by throwing money to the homeless or throwing money to missions or by doing some good deed somewhere. You only love your fellow man by loving them one at a time, by giving attention to them. Attention really feeds the heart of others. I was going through the grocery store the other day, and this little two-year-old was standing there, and uh, he wasn't doing anything. I just started paying attention to him, just looking at him, and he just lit up like a light bulb. Attention does that. His parents didn't feel that well, well about it, that some old man giving attention to their book, but, but it... He responded quite well. And I want to tell you, it's attention. This is what Bible study note B says. Bible study note B says, perfect love requires us to show others they really matter. They really matter. You don't throw money at them, but you let them know you love them by showing attention to them individually. Uh, Jack Nicholas, the golden bear, uh, we're fortunate to have a man of that stature uh, as a, uh, a member of our community. And this uh, week he received uh, the uh, gold medal from Congress. And I think you should applaud Jack. I thought that was very good. And I see you love Jack Nichols a whole lot, don't you? But we are fortunate to have him. I, I, I've watched him play when he was younger, when he was able to play, and nobody concentrated on the game more than he did. I mean, he would bear down on a golf ball, and you know his focus was on that sucker. He would, he would have some kind of look like this. And uh, I learn a lot from uh, the Golden Bear to play golf. Obviously, not enough, but I learn a lot. 
So during the celebration of receiving the gold medal uh, this week, uh, one of the reporters asked his son, Jack Nicholas Jr., said, what's it like being the son to Jack Nicholas? And here's what he said. He said, well, the best way to tell you is during the uh, 1986 Masters, Jack Nicholas won the Masters that year. It was the sixth time he won it. And he was the oldest man that ever won it at that time. So uh, here's what Jack Nicholas Jr. said. When he hit that last putt and he won by one stroke, the world just went crazy around him, the golf world. All the cameras, all the accolades, all the attention of the world was on him. And you know what Jack Nicholas did? His son said, he turned to me. He turned away from everybody else, and he turned to me. And he said, in that moment, I had his complete attention. Nobody knew his attention better than Jack Nicholas Jr. That man could focus like nobody could focus. And he said, at that moment, I had all his attention, and I knew I really mattered. If you want God's love to flow through you, find a way to make individuals really matter to you. Don't pretend you love them. Show you love them with your attention, with your interest in their life. You cannot love God whom you have not seen if you cannot love that person that's next door to you. Look into their life. Get involved in their life. Pay attention to them. Let them know they really matter. So uh, when my son was young, I took him to the dentist, to the orthodontist. And I said, can you help him? He said, Mr. Neal, I hate to tell you this, but your son has two problems. I said, what, what is it? He said he has straight hair and curly teeth. That's not good for the orthodontist to say. But then he gave me a picture or a, a set of these teeth. I don't know if he made them, who made them. I don't know who defined them. But he said, these are perfect teeth. These are perfect teeth. And this is what he said. He said, with your money and my effort and your son's pain, he will have perfect teeth. I said, let's go for it. Isn't that worth, isn't that worth the money? Isn't that worth the effort? Isn't that worth the pain? I mean, how many of you got perfect teeth? If you don't have it, what would you give to have perfect teeth? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you go through some pain to have it? What does it take to have perfect love? If it's attainable, it's going to cost you something. Are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to aspire to something that would make your life worth living? I, I know some of you will work your, you'll work your tail off to earn 100000 a year. How hard will you work to develop love in your life, to enjoy your life in a way that money can never buy? Amen? Let's stand and pray. Father, we thank you for your word today, and we thank you for Jesus, who is the epitome, the embodiment of perfect love. Oh, God, we, we desire to have more of Jesus in our lives. So as he is, so are we in this world. Let us, let us affirm our position in Christ, that we may have our condition in the world transformed. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, believe me, Jesus loved you enough to die for you. The cross that you saw a while ago, it was beautiful, and yet it was horrible. And the real one was much more hideous than that. And he went through it. He endured it for you. Would you let him come into your life? Would you let him forgive you of your sins and give you a gift, a gift of eternal life? If you would, I'd like for you to come when we sing the first verse of this hymn. We'll pray with you and show you in the Bible how you can be saved. And we'll give you some literature to grow in your Christian walk. If you're already a Christian and you want to be baptized or join the church, we'd like for you to come as well. And if you'd like to come and pray for someone or have us to pray for you or for healing, for salvation, for whatever, you come as we sing this first verse. 
and join us at the altar and we'll pray.